Very warm welcome to the Octopus's Garden series. Uh, today's topic is sea level rise, the big picture. So I would like to start today's proceedings by recognizing that we are on unceded Coast Salish territory and we are grateful to the peoples of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil Waututh people uh, for allowing us to be here. My name is Zafar Adil. I'm the Executive Director of the Pacific Water Research Center. Uh, just by way of introduction, my own research interest is on water security in the face of changing climate, and also to look at the nexus between water, energy, and food. And, and uh, hopefully I'll get a chance to talk about some of those things as we go through the discussion part of today's proceedings. So today is the grand finale of the five series uh, uh, symposia on sea level rise. We're very grateful for the partners who have joined the Pacific Water Research Center in organizing this. That includes the Adaptation to Climate Change team at SFU, which is actually a part of uh, the center and the Faculty of Environment. We also had Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, the City of Vancouver, Vancouver Board of Parks and Recreation, and the Vancouver Aquarium. So we're very grateful that these partners have come together to discuss this important issue. And we started the series by asking a bit of a rhetorical question. Who will be tending to your vegetable garden when the sea level rises? An octopus, a sea star? So the, and it was a bit humorous, of course, uh, and to draw your attention. The series featured uh, a range of experts on sea level rise from a wide range of backgrounds. And they addressed ways in which we can adapt and uh, build resilience. And the focus that they took was all the way from local to global, and they identified both the challenges we are facing and solutions that are either being implemented or on their way. So, and I'm sure many of you have been part of uh, this conversation and the dialogue. Uh, maybe I'll pause here and ask, how many of you have had uh, already been at one or more of these sessions before? Wonderful, thank you. So it looks like about a third of the people at least have been to others. So you know the narrative and the story quite well, the basics about sea level rise caused by warming water that expands uh, as, as the climate warms and melting uh, ice on land also causes uh, the sea level to rise. And we also know that warmer uh, temperature uh, in, in, as a result of climate change also caused uh, intensification of various storms, and uh, when those are combined with uh, sea level rise, uh, the, the damage can be really devastating. And I think just to underline that point, if you, if you look at just the hurricane season this year, uh, and we have now some of the numbers of, uh, you know, what the impacts have been. Hurricane Harvey uh, that hit mostly Houston in August, the damage is $180 billion. Hurricane Irma, which uh, primarily hit Florida uh, in August and in early September, the damage is estimated at about $200 billion. Hurricane Maria that hit Puerto Rico and the Caribbean region uh, in, in late September, uh, the damage is estimated between five and $95 billion. And there was then Hurricane Nate that uh, almost did not make the news, and we don't know what the damage uh, from that is yet, and that hit Louisiana and, and the coastal areas there. So just in one hurricane season, we've had almost half a trillion dollars of damage, uh, and just in one region of the world. There are other parts of the world, such as the small island nations in the Pacific Ocean, uh, and also Delta-based civilizations, uh, which will be quite directly and seriously impacted by sea level rise. And we also have a number of northern Inuit uh, coastal towns, southern US tribes that are already facing displacement from their homesteads. So the narrative that we've heard in this series uh, is both uh, daunting and also encouraging. What we've heard, uh, particularly in, in a session where we had uh, two First Nations chiefs here, that the rising sea levels are not really new. Uh, and there is a 
almost a 15,000 year history and there's historical record uh, of how people back then cope with uh, really drastic sea level changes. We also heard that uh, rising sea levels and combined climate change uh, will also create refugees and we need to be better prepared compared to where we are now. Some of the projections show that the range of refugees could be anywhere between 50 and 350 million people displaced by climate change by the year 2050. So pretty, pretty big numbers to, to ponder on. But we also heard the flip of, uh, of that situation. Uh, we uh, heard Hank Ovink, who was uh, President Obama's advisor to uh, deal with Hurricane Sandy, and he argued that communities can come together in innovative ways to adapt to challenges that are posed by sea level rise. Uh, and he uh, described to us this rebuild by design uh, initiative that really worked wonders and won many awards afterwards. We've also heard that different levels of government can come together and from national to local and, and really start to address some of these challenges and enable communities. So today, uh, as the penultimate uh, session of this dialogue, uh, we're trying to wrap our arms around all of those issues together. And we have three wonderful uh, and, and brilliant speakers who are going to walk us through uh, those scales. And, and I'll introduce them each uh, respectively uh, at their turn. Uh, but I think at, at this point I would like to say that we'll start by looking at the global, continent, and a national scale. And, John Englander, who, whom I will introduce in a minute, uh, we'll, we'll start with that. We'll go to the provincial scale, and Dr. Sybil Seitzinger will walk us through what is happening right here in, uh, in BC, and perhaps draw on experiences of other uh, subnational jurisdiction. And we'll conclude with looking at the urban dimension of the, of the issues, and uh, uh, Gil Kelly from the uh, city of Vancouver will walk us through of what is happening right here in our own backyard. So let me start by uh, introducing John Englander, uh, who's our first speaker of the day. Um, actually, let me pause and, and just describe the process. So we'll go through all three presentations first, and each of them will take about 15 to 20 minutes to, uh, to present ideas with you. And we'll then start with a discussion amongst the panelists, and then we'll switch to having an open floor as we've done in the past sessions, and we'll invite you to join in the conversation. So John Englander is an oceanographer, and he's a leading expert in the world on sea level rise. Uh, he's the former CEO of the Cousteau Society, and interestingly works with businesses, with government agencies, and communities to understand the financial risks of sea level rise, as well as the economic opportunities that will allow us to thrive if we begin to plan and adapt now. So he really and truly advocates uh, intelligent adaptation. So his uh, book, which is a bestseller, uh, High Tide on Main Street, uh, it's now in second edition, I understand. Um, and uh, he's been uh, going throughout uh, the, the world and, and talking about these issues. So we are very pleased that he's here uh, with us today and to share his thoughts and ideas. So John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adil. It's uh, always fun to come back to Vancouver. I think I've been here probably 30 times over the years and talked to uh, a few of you have heard me in different forums, but we can't talk too much about sea level rise probably. It's, um, as, as you've already heard, and if you've been here to other sessions before, you realize this is an enormous problem, and we could spend 30 hours over 30 years talking about it, and we'll still be trying to figure out what to do with it. So let me um, give you some perspective on that, but recognizing that some of this you've heard from different uh, framings, different terms. I like to uh, avoid all jargon. I don't even use the word. Um, uh, um, any, any scientific words. I want it to be understandable, as they say by right, you know, a, a sixth grader in effect. And I think sometimes when we're talking about uh, climate with mitigation, 
uh, is, is a, a term that's often used. We, we don't realize that that's not a commonly used word. And so rather to say, better to say slow the warming or reduce the flood hazard, which are the two totally different meanings for the word mitigation. So, uh, and I encourage you to do the same, because once we are concerned about climate, we do tend to get into that mitigation and adaptation. We like jargon, you know? And, but the truth is it's really the opposite in terms of how to engage wider audiences. The world is warming. You've probably seen different depictions. This is a NASA graphic that shows in, the, in a recent five-year period to kind of smooth out anomalies, how have temperatures changed compared to the prior century, actually since 1880, since we began keeping meteorologic records? And you'll notice the red on that, which is two degrees Celsius or 3.6 Fahrenheit, is mostly at the high Arctic, or high latitudes, I should say. So much more Canadian impact, or Scandinavian, than, uh, than lower latitudes. And that's for a variety of reasons. But you're seeing the effect, of course, from all across Canada, and, um, and then up into the high Arctic. There's a lot of talk about the Paris Climate Accord from December 2015. This simple thermometer done by a group called Climate Interactive uh, out of MIT is, a, I think, a brilliantly simple characterization or depiction that shows that the goal is the green, two degrees Celsius, or 3.6 Fahrenheit there. Um, if the calculation is the yellow is if we don't do anything, we're gonna reach that temperature, four and a half degrees Celsius. Now this is all relative to what they call pre-industrial. We've already warmed a degree Celsius. So the goal is to keep the warming to another degree Celsius, but it's being pretty well accepted now, we probably won't be able to do that. And you're probably seeing in the news because they're in Bonn, with the next climate conference at the moment, COP23, I think it is. And um, they're starting to talk about maybe, it, maybe it'll be three degrees, maybe another two degrees beyond where the degree we've already warmed. The blue says the best calculation of all of the proposals on the table to get us off carbon dioxide uh, and other fossil fuels to reduce the warming and affect the, the global temperature change would be three and a half degrees Celsius. So wh where it, wherever it falls in that range, depending on how hard we try, how many people we have and how we make our fuel is up for, you know, we'll have to see what happens. But here's the point that few people have realized is that even if we could reach the target goal, it would be double the warming we've already experienced. So from a standpoint of what does that do to the ice, is this gonna work? There we go. When we look at the, the melting polar ice cap, the Arctic Ocean, and uh, it's gonna keep melting, even if we reach the goal by doing all the things to reduce the warming further. We gotta keep that in mind. Now, the melting polar ice cap, the, the ice around the, the, uh, the North Pole, as it were, is, uh, gets our attention and it's disappearing and it's been frozen for millions of years. Um, as we go from bright white to dark ocean, it's like painting the roof of a house that was white a dark color. You know, the heating bill's gonna change or the air conditioning bill because of heat absorption. So things change. But floating ice has no effect on sea level. Most people don't know that. Probably if you're involved in this and you're at this meeting tonight, you're, you're aware of that. But most people believe that melting icebergs contribute to sea level rise. And I tell them, take a glass and put some ice in it and let the ice melt and you'll see the level hasn't changed. You have to add ice cubes or add liquid to get the level higher in the glass, right? Or drink from it to get it down. Well, it's the ice on land, a glacier here about to enter the water or break off into icebergs, and that's when sea level will rise. The other thing is that as we warm the ocean, they expand slightly, thermal expansion. Those are the, the so it's melting ice, um, breaking off or like an iceberg, it's melt water from ice on land or thermal expansion of seawater. Many of you probably know that, but those are the things that can raise sea level globally. Then locally, if the land subsides or sinks, like it's doing in, let's say, New Orleans or Jakarta or Venice, or uplifts as it's doing in the high latitudes of Alaska and, and probably northern Canada, land moves upward, so subsidence downward, up, 
uplift is, uh, is upward, those adjust sea level more or less because we're looking at it from the land. The problem is the ice that's on Greenland and Antarctica. As shown here, um, that's 98% of the ice in the world. And those are really the only two places that matter. I mean, thermal expansion has been important in the last century, and it's contributed about 10 centimeters. But in the coming century, the, it's all about the melting from Greenland and Antarctica. Now, I was flying back from, uh, I was in Greenland last, uh, a few months ago, and I went from Greenland to Copenhagen. Uh, Greenland's part of the Danish kingdom. And then I took a flight from London, and I was talking to the guy on the seat you know, next to me. I didn't know him somewhere during the flight. And uh, this was, you know, how on, the, on the seat in front of you, you have these maps the, you know, to, to kind of track your journey. And we were talking, and he asked me what I was doing, and I talked about I worked on sea level, and I was also talking to the Danish government and had been in Greenland the week before. And he uh, looked at me and he said, and this is right in front of his face now, he said, where's Greenland? It reminded me of our geographic ignorance. I, I really, I, I bit my tongue, I didn't really know what to say to him, okay? But we got through that. And uh, there's a little distortion in this because of spreading out the, the, the round, roundish globe, of course. But to give you this important to look at because it puts things in, in scale, although the, the, the image of Greenland has widened at the north part, the relative size is that Greenland's about the size of the eastern United States or eastern Canada. And when you add in Antarctica, we're looking at a land area covered by ice that's the same size as North America. And it's covered by over a kilometer of ice vertical. That's what's starting to melt. That's what will cause sea level rise. It would be hard to, I mean, it, it's again not in our face. We see flooding, you know, when, when we get king tides and things like that and we worry about it. But this is the cause of the problem. It's been frozen for millions of years and I'll, I'll kind of take you through that. I took that photo flying into Greenland um, a year ago. When I'd been there Four years prior, that was all covered by ice. The ice sheet is retreating. Greenland, we used to say, was about 90% covered by its ice sheet. Now it's about 80% covered. Still a lot of ice to melt. It won't all melt this century, but it's happening in front of our eyes. Going down to the southern hemisphere, to uh, Antarctica, of course, the penguin territory, not the polar bear territory. Antarctica is bigger, more mountainous has seven times the sea level locked up. You probably heard about Antarctica last summer where the yellow arrow is on the Antarctic Peninsula, part of the Larsen Sea ice shelf broke off. I'm sure you may have seen that in the news. But again, that was a giant iceberg, 150 kilometers by 50, that broke off an ice shelf. The ice shelf is already floating on the ocean. So that iceberg breaking away had no effect on sea level. However, as, the, as these ice shells, which fill bays, um, as they collapse or disintegrate, then glaciers from land can, can slide into the sea, and that's what will cause sea level rise. So it's a little more complicated than might be obvious. The problem in Antarctica is the two red arrows, the Pine Island glaciers on the left and the Totten Glacier on the right. There are seven glaciers that are being highly tracked because they hold the equivalent of six meters of sea level rise. We don't know when they're going to slide into the sea and raise sea level that much. It, won't, it can't possibly happen in the next 20 or 30 years. We don't know whether it will happen by the year 2100 or the year 2200. That is just hard scientific fact. Now, it's, they're melting faster and faster. That's the problem. And typically in the science journals, we kind of put a question mark next to the amount because we don't know when. And if the question is how high will sea level rise by 2100 or 2050, unless you know it'll happen with certainty, you're not gonna put your scientific reputation on that. The problem is the magnitude of that, that even if a third of that goes into the ocean, we have um, two meters of sea level rise. That's gonna swamp pretty much all coastal cities in the world. 
Now, the good news is it can happen too quickly. If you look at the glaciers in detail, which we can now do with the great satellite imagery and on the ice observations, we have decades to begin to prepare for this. What's, what is sea level doing? Well, that's the graph since the 1880. Uh, sea level's been going up pretty consistently. If you were to lay a straight edge across that, you'd see that the slope is increasing actually pretty quickly now. Um, people may want to make noise about the little perturbations, the little ups and downs, but if, I like to say if that was a stock, you'd buy it, right? Um, you wouldn't care that there were little wiggles in the line. And when people say, well, I think it's going down. Now, if you look at this 11-year period, you know, maybe it's, there's a downward slant. Who cares? I mean, it's been 135 years. It's going straight up um, consistently and accelerating. That's the problem. Now, if you step back to the last ice age, this big picture to kind of put things in perspective, and that's what I want to put in what we call the paleo record, the, the ancient record, to give us perspective since the last ice age, I'm sorry, this is in feet, should be 120 meters for up here. Um, 120 meters, 390 feet. Sea level rose and got to the present level about 5,000 years ago. For most of us, that's our civilization. That's the Mayan, uh, Chinese, and Jewish calendars go back about 5,000 years. And our civilization go back maybe six or eight. Now, in Haida Gwaii, and I was with the lady from Haida Gwaii today up at uh, SFU Burnaby, they've been on Haida Gwaii for 13,000 years that we know of. And they actually t have tales describing the water rising quickly. So they predate what we would think of as, as civilization. But it's interesting because it confirms what we know geologically. Now, the, besides the fact that sea level got to the present level about 5,000 years ago, which is why we just can't possibly believe it's going to change, is it's interesting that there are three inflection points or changes of slope. And if you were at any one of those three arrows and you looked behind you to say what had sea level done in the last century, you'd really have no indication of what was about to happen. It'd be like trying to prevent a car accident looking in your rearview mirror. And that's happened before, and it's pretty obvious that's happening again. We're, we're having a slope change. So, a lot of the measurements that people are using, um, this, this is why it's happening. And if you saw the four-part scientific series, the Ice Age, the Meltdown, uh, this is part two. And I do that to get people to laugh because I've already kind of depressed them so much. But on top of that, it's a good visual to remember that that's what's happened, and that was a natural cycle. And 20,000 years ago, there was like three kilometers of ice in North America and Asia. And as that melted, sea level rose 120 meters. That makes sense. That's about as technical as you need to get with this stuff. We make it harder than it needs to be. Now, sea levels changed up and down over geologic time because of the ice ages, and that's, that's the pattern. It becomes clearer when we overlay that 400,000 years in red temperature. So blue is sea level, red is temperature, and green is carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas. And it's, if you start with the red line, temperature, the ice ages are pretty obvious. The peak of the last ice age was about 20,000 years ago. The last warm spot was 120,000 years ago. It's almost 100,000 years as a cycle pattern, something called the Milankovitch cycle. It's based upon orbital changes, which it's like a giant summer and winter is what it is. And it's because of configurations of the planet. When it's warmer, there's less ice, sea levels higher. I mean, it's really simple, right? And Carbon dioxide was proven in 1859 to trap heat. And Alexander Graham Bell, a famous Canadian-American, um, warned us in 1917, 100 years ago, that if we keep burning fossil fuels, we'll warm the planet, and advised that we should explore solar energy. This is not new information. Where are we? Okay. We get that data by ice cores from Greenland 130,000 years and Antarctica 800,000 years. In that person's fingers is a year of ice that's been compacted, or snow into ice, I should say. And the air bubbles, the kind of white spots there, are air samples. And we can go in there and get the percentage of carbon dioxide that year. And there's two different isotopes of oxygen, 16 and 18, and they vary by molecular weight with temperature, so we have a, a relative temperature record. So 
with rising sea level, to bring this back to, you know, to the practical issue, which you're about to get for the rest of this panel, is to me there's three important questions. How high and how soon? Can it be slowed or stopped? And what do we do about it? Those are pretty simple questions, right? So how high, how soon? As I've explained to you, we really can't predict exactly. But here's what I say. We don't know whether it's going to be five or 10 feet, you know, meter and a half to three meters this century, frankly. But let's start planning for the first, first meter as soon as possible. Don't assume it's going to be the end of the century. It could be sooner. And if we think about the first meter and kind of underlining the first, we'll get our heads around the fact that there's more to follow. But the first meter is a good you know, step up, and it's, it's going to be a challenge. But we can do it. There are places that will be underwater, but we have plenty of warning. Can it be slowed or stopped? If we do the right things and slow greenhouse gas emissions and through all the things that are being proposed, we can slow sea level rise eventually. We can no longer stop it. We have warmed the oceans a degree Celsius. That heat's not going anywhere for centuries. Eventually, maybe we can get it to go down again, but we'd have to get it below the cooling phase of the ice ages, which means getting it probably down to 300 parts per million of CO2, and it's at 406 right now. Uh, that's not going to happen anytime real soon. So we can slow it, and we should try, but let's get out of our heads that if we just do enough good things, this problem will go away. What should we do about it? We need to start adapting. And while the temptation is to say, well, we'll adapt when we know for sure how high it's going to rise, that's dumb. Because the truth is, for infrastructure, as I'm sure Gil and Sybil are going to tell you, and for, for greater planning purposes, the earlier you start to plan, the better. Because we use infrastructure, roads, water plants, highways, um, rail, rail lines, ports. We use them for hundreds of years. We may modify them. We can't wait 23 years until those glaciers from Antarctica slide into the sea to say, now is the time to lift, lift everything up two meters. If Hank was, when Hank was here, I asked, he may have shown you the famous uh, image of the, the Maslant carrying the big gates at Rotterdam Harbor. There's a good news and bad news to, to this Dutch engineering that they're famous for. It shows that with the right geography and you know, water configuration, we may be able to put a, a, a storm gate in, which is what that is. And there's a similar one in St. Petersburg, Russia, and uh, Providence, Rhode Island, et cetera. But the Dutch engineers have told me that if they were building this again, and this is only 20 some years old, they would have built it two or three meters higher. Because when they designed this, they planned for a one in 10,000 year storm for the worst river flooding from the three rivers that come down from Europe there. And they allowed for 30 centimeters of sea level rise. Because in the 1980s, that was the worst they could imagine. They now realize it should be like three or four meters. So we can do amazing things, but we need to plan big enough. Is it risk or opportunity? It's both. There's huge risk. But you know, if we lose $10 trillion of value to the ocean this century, we will be creating that same value for economic um, assets, for, for residences, for cities. I think it's going to almost even out. Now, there's going to be huge losses, but there's going to be huge gains. Right? I mean, if Miami goes underwater, it's not like those people are all going to drown. In fact, sea level's so slow, probably nobody needs to die from it. You can crawl out of the way of sea level rise. It's really slow. But that, those same people are going to go somewhere else and do their business somewhere else, and it's going to happen over decades. So it's one of those things that it's actually probably a self-canceling phenomenon. Now, that doesn't mean there won't be losses, but the sooner we can wake up and see the opportunity and not wait for the government to just bail us out of it. Because the truth is we all have to take responsibility of this. And thinking that the UN or the US government or the Canadian government is going to just write a check and make you whole is, I think, unrealistic. We're starting an International Sea Level Institute. It could have an office here. And uh, some of you actually have expressed interest of helping us to try and find some uh, financial support for that. So please get a hold of me or look up its website. Um, we're going to open an office in Copenhagen, one in probably Singapore, probably one in the US, and, and perhaps one in Canada. 
If you want to get a hold of my slides, just slides at johnenglander.net. I do a weekly newsletter you can subscribe to, and there's no ads or anything like that. So I, um, I'm pleased to be part of this panel, and I uh, haven't met Sybil before. I've known Gil since he was in San Francisco. And um, I think it's just great that Canada and SFU and um, the, the PIC Center here has uh, put on this series. And it's, it's, um, it's great that you have the interest to come back and hear more of this. So thank you. Thank you very much, John. That was brilliant. So you've uh, left us with a mental picture of what it would look like, and we can actually quite gently crawl out of the way of sea level rise. Um, but I, I think uh, it, it, it's actually good to end on that high note because it gives us a sense of uh, what is it that we need to do uh, to, to address these issues. And I think that's where we are now going to go. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Sybil Seitzinger. She's the executive director for the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, uh, or PEAKS as we say it. Uh, Sybil has a very extensive experience uh, of uh, uh, collaborative international research. She was the executive director for the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, which was based in Sweden, and it was a global program that was looking at precisely the kind of changes that we are discussing here today. And she worked uh, in integrating work of researchers uh, across Africa, the Americas, Asia Pacific, uh, and Europe, and basically really trying to drill through the global environmental changes. She's also served as the president of the American Society of Limnology and Oceanography, and has had a really a distinguished career. So we're quite... Uh, pleased and privileged that she's uh, joined the panel. So, Sybil, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, and it's a delight to be here tonight and to see all these wonderful faces in the audience. And um, I'm delighted to hear that many of you have come to a number of these uh, um, sessions on sea level rise. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit, though, to start out about the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. And I emphasize the word solutions because that's what we're about. We're about solutions for climate change. And we're a collaboration across the four major research universities here in British Columbia. So drawing on this wide range of expertise to address how to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases and how to plan for the changes in our climate system that we can't avoid. And we do this not only in collaboration with the researchers and with students across the universities, but also very much so engaging with decision makers throughout the province. So I thought I would take my um, minutes tonight to talk to you through the lens of three students' research that PIX has been supporting. Um, ben Pelto, Jackie Yip, who I think is here in the audience, and also Cher King Scoby. Um, and um, I think that John really set the stage for much of what I'm going to talk about. So thank you so much for many of the things that, that you brought up tonight. I'm going to start out by talking about glaciers. Now, while John said that, you know, glaciers aren't important in terms of sea level rise, actually, if all the glaciers melted, we'd have a 0.4 meter increase in sea level. So that's not trivial. That's not trivial. So it is important that we understand the magnitude of glacier melting, net glacier melting around the world. And we have a lot of glaciers here right in BC. And Brian, or Ben Pelto has been looking at the mass balance of glaciers in the Columbia River Basin. One of the challenges, of course, in measuring the mass balance is that it's hard to get to these glaciers. It's dangerous in many cases. And the measurements are very much point measurements. So he's been using uh, some remote sensing um, laser altimetry on aircraft to see if his in situ or his field measurements of the change in glaciers lurking in the Columbia River Basin can be also um, 
correlated with measurements that are made by aircraft with this um, laser altimetry. And actually, he's finding a very good correspondence between these two approaches so that you can get a much wider range spatially and temporally of the changes in these glaciers. And the red dots, if you could see them, would show you where the glaciers that he's been making these measurements are. But the thing I want to point out to you is that the, over the four-year period that he's been making these measurements, that there's been a loss of the equivalent of four meters of water from these glaciers in just four years. Right? Now, you may think, wow, that's a lot. Well, it is a lot. Yeah. Um, however, it's about the global average for loss of mass in um, glaciers around the world. So this information is contributing to the global knowledge base on what's happening with glaciers, right? But it's also very important in that it's contributing to our understanding of river flows and where they might, what, what the change in river flows might be in the future. And BC Hydro, which you all pay money to probably for your electric bills, has been using information um, from this study and others to make some projections of what the change in river flows and therefore the change in hydroelectricity potential in the province might be as we move forward into the future. They're also using information such as this to um, plan for um, salmon habitat changes and water resource availability in the province. So moving on to how to prepare for the changes in sea level rise um, in, in the province. And what is PICS doing? Well, John very nicely laid out some of the challenges here. One of the challenges, as he noted, is that there's great uncertainty in both the magnitude of sea level rise as well as the rate at which it's going to increase. And so you can imagine from the perspective of a planner for Vancouver or Victoria or Miami, um, you know, how do you take into consideration this uncertainty in planning for how to protect um, the infrastructure, your people that are living there, and plan for the future? And it's not just the change in sea level rise that's uncertain um, that planners have to deal with, but also how the population is going to change in the area and how the land use is going to change. So it's, it can be a daunting task for planners. So um, Jackie Yip, though, has taken on this challenge. And um, she has been looking at develop, how to develop some robust impact patterns for sea level rise using a wide range of information, which I'll mention in a minute. Um, and she's using Vancouver as her, her case study. And she actually had an expert workshop just last week presenting some of the preliminary results. And so I'm going to try and describe a little bit about what she's been doing. So what she's been looking at is trying to get a grip on how um, reducing the range of um, futures, basically, that a planner could, might want to use in developing approaches to managing the sea level rise in Vancouver in this case. And so she's, her initial assumption is that there will be no more adaptation action in the future. Of course, that's not the case. Vancouver is planning. Um, actions are happening. But in terms of this um, work that she's been doing, that was the base situation that she's dealing with. And then she's looked at a range of um, storm intensities, um, uh, one in 50-year storm, et cetera, coming through, the range of sea level rise that might happen between now and the end of the century, in just 80 years, actually, um, as well as factors in how population and land use distribution in, in this, around the city of Vancouver might change. For example, is it going to be a compact um, sort of build out or will it be sort of more urban sprawl? Also considering a range of different options in terms or, or situations in terms of power outages, et cetera. So you can imagine um, if you have to take all these different things into consideration, uh, how would you manage that or how would you do that? So she, what she has done is developed um, a, a wide number of coastal flooding scenarios by the, taking in the combinations of all of these different factors into consideration. And it results in 
336 future coastal flooding scenarios for Vancouver. So you can imagine if you were the planner for Vancouver, what your head would be doing with all these 300 and so scenarios bouncing around and trying to figure out how to plan for it. But Jackie has some ideas about how to do that. Now she's not only looking at the coastal flooding extent um, in, in Vancouver under these various um, options, um, but also what would be the impact. And so she's looking at 14 different impact um, um, factors, let's say, or situations. Um, in term, for example, economic impacts such as how would the, what would be the damage to buildings in the various sectors such as residential, commercial, government sectors? What would be some of the impacts on the social um, component of the city? What would be the impact, for example, on schools, on healthcare facilities, et cetera? And what would be some of the environmental impacts, including, as you can imagine, with, with flooding, what would be the impact on the sewage systems in the city? So she's looking at, um, under this wide range of, of flooding scenarios, what would be the impacts on these 14 um, different uh, versions that we see there. So what she's done is taken the th over 300 um, future flood scenarios that she came up with and looked at the impacts of those 336 flooding scenarios on that whole range of 14 um, impacts that we just saw to buildings, um, social services, environment, et cetera. And using um, machine learning, um, reduce that to 14 robust impact patterns for these variables. So basically, uh, really seeing what are the um, prevalent scenarios and um, that, that, that would occur when you combine all this information and comes up with 16 of them. So reducing it for th from 336 down to 16 robust ones. So it's much more reduced range of um, situations that potentially the planners can use to develop approaches to dealing with a quite wide range in uncertainty and how sea level rise will play out. I'll give you one example um, that she's provided us with, um, and that is looking at temporary business closures in the city as a result of power outage, building damage, and water outage. And this would be in the tertiary sector, which I think is the service sector of the city, buildings in that sector. And this is just one example, and I want to emphasize that these, as she has said, these are preliminary results, but it gives you an idea of this, first of all, the spatial detail that she's dealing with here for the city of Vancouver. And this scenario is um, also assuming or what would happen if the sea level rose by two to three meters. That's not saying that it's going to rise by two to three meters, but if it did, what would be the business disruption in the service sector? Um, and you can see areas in the city that are the orange and red areas or orange and yellow areas that would have more impact, um, higher impact. You can see where those might be. Um, but I think she came up with, it would be over 2,000 businesses um, in that sector would be disrupted under this scenario. Um, as I said, she presented this at a workshop um, last week. As I understand it, there were people not only from Vancouver City there, but also from the province, from the federal, um, as well as many practitioners. So it's a way that um, some new approaches being developed by um, um, our, throughout our uni with our, through our universities can work with the city and help to inform them and work with their experts as well. Because I'm sure John will tell us a lot about how Vancouver is already planning for um, the impacts of sea level rise. So what are some of the innovations that are occurring around the world in dealing with sea level rise? Sea levels happening, rise is happening around the world. In cities around the world, 
countries around the world are trying to address this. And there are some really innovative approaches that are being taken. And another student, a uh, PhD candidate, Cher King Scobie, um, has been working with the Fraser Basin Council through a PICS funded internship and really pulling together information from the global literature on ways that jurisdictions around the world are planning to deal with sea level rise. So she's done a global literature review and then looked at, considered what are the social, economic, and ecological conditions in the lower mainland here in BC, and then chose 10 case studies from that global literature review that she thought might be most relevant to the lower main, our lower mainland situation here. And they have a document that's going to be published soon and, and uh, distributed to communities in the lower, in the lo the lower mainland sorry, um, of the province. And again, she's given us an example of some of the information in this um, document that's being produced. And I can see you can't read it, because I can't read it. Uh, but that's OK, because I didn't expect you to be able to read it. Um, but this is one example um, of a couple of pages in this document. And she calls this the Cliff Notes pages. And this um, particular case study is from the Netherlands, which John talked about. Um, and this um, summary of the situation in the Netherlands that she's highlighted basically um, is an example of it, it talks about what is it, where is it used, how does it work, what are some of the costs and benefits, and how that, that apply in various instances to the lower mainland. But what I'd like you to focus on actually here is these maps of the Netherlands. And as, as John noted, the Netherlands has been a leader in um, developing dikes because 25% of the Netherlands is actually below sea level. You know, it's reclaimed land. And so they have a long history and much experience with keeping the sea out. Um, and the map on the left, which is a map of the Netherlands, um, shows you the risk of death of individuals um, in various areas of the Netherlands as a result of a major um, storm breaching the dikes. And what they have right now with their current planning process has been that the, um, there are certain areas in the Netherlands that have a much higher risk of death of individuals with a major flooding event. And those are the areas that you see in orange. Um, but their new approach, which is quite innovative, is that they're planning to their investments in infrastructure, in their pumping of water, which they have to do continually out of the Netherlands, as well as many other things that they'll be doing to deal with sea level rise, such that now, instead of having a really uneven distribution of impact or deaths if they had a major flooding event, um, now they will be working towards, by 2050, to have a low probability of death of individuals throughout the country. So an even, much more, you might think of, um, of justice, of climate justice, in a way, in the country um, as a result of potential flooding. So I think I'll close there and just remind you that uh, we've talked about three different um, research coming out of students in the province, um, looking not only at the rate of glacial melting, um, but also how we might reduce uncertainty in the range of scenarios that planners would deal with in terms of making future um, investments and assessing the risk, as well as how we are building on the global knowledge from around the world to help inform our own communities right here. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sybil. That was great. I, I think uh, um, two things that I took from your presentation. One, that uh, you know, we can start with a global picture, but we can start to distill it down to how it impacts us more directly. And, and there are some uh, interesting approaches for doing that. 
And the other thing is that there are uh, tools which are available to us today that will allow us to explore different scenarios in terms of how, how we can adapt to some of these changes. Uh, and those solutions are being built and applied right here uh, in, in BC. So that, that's great to hear. And, and I think, as you said, it's a good segue then to start to talk about how the city itself is responding. So we're, we're very pleased to have uh, Gil Kelly uh, with us tonight. He's the general manager for planning, urban design, and sustainability uh, with the city of Vancouver. Uh, so he essentially leads the city's work on all city planning, visioning, policy, uh, urban design, and any major development negotiations. So he's essentially responsible also for the effective implementation of the Greenest City Action Plan. Uh, and he's no stranger to being in this uh, role. He has previously uh, served as the director of planning for both the cities of San Francisco and Portland. Uh, and brings a lot of experience from, uh, you know, from uh, uh, those kind of appointments. So, uh, Gil, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening. It's okay to say good evening back. <laughs> there we go. Well, at least we're awake. All right. Um, yeah, I, before I get into my slide deck here, I just want to sort of pick up on something that John said to start with, which is um, how difficult it is, this topic is, for, for ordinary people to think about um, beyond, beyond a very superficial level. And I was reminded as he was talking uh, about um, an event that I participated in in 2009, I believe it was a climate change uh, summit in, in Dubrovnik. <clears throat> Uh, uh, and, um, uh, you know, beautiful uh, Croatian shoreline, nice place to hang out for a week with uh, European and North American representatives on the topic of climate change and what we might do about it. And <clears throat> the uh, North Americans there, uh, I happen to represent the city of Portland there, so it was a mix of academics and practitioners. And um, so we were all into talking to North Americans about the uh, the mitigation phenomenon, right? How we actually reduce the further acceleration of global warming by building compact cities, getting off of coal, uh, doing the right things with transportation options and so forth. Uh, the Europeans, by comparison, said, that's old news. We do all that stuff already. Uh, we're totally about adaptation. And so we heard from them about all kinds of landscape treatments and buildings on stilts and all kinds of things like that with one exception, and a practitioner from uh, Poland, a uh, young woman who was the development director for the port of Gdansk said, bring it on, you know, we're, it's awfully chilly in Poland in the winter time, <laughs> and, uh, and um, we actually think we have a whole new, uh, uh, whole new concept for the port, that we will be using our shoreline for tourism We'll be putting up beach umbrellas. And she was actually serious. I mean, she was really like, this is the future. Of course, she wasn't acknowledging that the summers might be too hot for anyone to really want to be out on the beach. And secondly, that there may not be a beach there anymore with sea level rise. And so uh, my reason for recounting that little uh, story is that uh, I think in the nine years since, there has actually been uh, an elevation of understanding um, both within the professional and academic communities, but also within the public, that, that this phenomenon um, is a little bit more clear, a little bit more present, um, if not yet um, readily uh, understandable in terms of what to do about it, in terms of the solutions. So there's progress, but I guess the point of all this is that there's a lot of learning left to do, a lot of experimentation left to do, and a lot of uh, learning from that experimentation. And so at the city of Vancouver, we're actually in the very early stages of this, thinking about solutions. We're really educating the public primarily about the phenomenon, about what are the areas that are most susceptible to inundation and flooding uh, in Vancouver uh, and how that might affect their lives. And the next phases going forward will be to actually venture into uh, what we might do about it, what might be some solutions. Uh, the other piece that I think John mentioned that was absolutely critical is it's also, not only is it hard for the human mind to think in geologic time frames, um, but it's hard particularly for the engineers who want to build stuff 
to think about adaptable solutions and differentiating. What are the ones that really are 150-year uh, investments that you want to kind of overbuild? And what are the things that we just say, you know, let's, let's just try, uh, do our best, and if we have to change it in the future, we'll do that. And that's very difficult for a lot of uh, practitioners. So with that little bit of introduction, um, you now can focus on the eye candy here. The um, first point here is that really uh, cities are in a common struggle, particularly coastal cities. Um, on the top image here, most of you have probably seen is the big U uh, concept that resulted from a design uh, challenge that um, Hank Ovink uh, sort of conceived of and, and uh, led in uh, the New York region post Hurricane Sandy, which I think is an interesting combination of protection or fortification and, and retreat uh, and adaptation. Uh, New Orleans, where um, I participated in a number of workshops a few years ago post um, Hurricane Katrina, where um, the conventional thought process of uh, repelling water by building uh, stronger and stronger uh, levees and dikes was kind of flipped on its head and, and the notion of living with water was introduced where the water is actually part of the urban environment and is managed and, and uh, seeps out or is pumped out, but that every, every neighborhood has to be able to accommodate uh, water, not simply uh, repel it. And in San Francisco, where I spent some time uh, in the planning role there, um, we actually developed uh, at least the first stage of a sea level rise uh, action plan, and that work is continuing uh, today. So I just wanted to highlight a, a few things out of that experience before getting uh, to Vancouver. Uh, one of the things that um, we did is probably wrestle for a year and a half amongst different departments about well, what is sea level, what's the number? What, what, is, what should we be planning for? Uh, we finally settled on these two scenarios of uh, 66 inches and then 108 inches um, end of century with storm surge, king tide, and so forth and so on. And uh, during the middle of that debate, uh, we actually called John in, <laughs> uh, who really said, you know, the, to answer his first uh, question on his slide, uh, how high and how soon? He basically said, higher than you think and sooner than you think. So just get started. To pick a meter of sea level rise, that's good enough to get started and get going. Know that it'll probably be higher, uh, and so think about the scale of the repair and investments you need to make, but just get started. And for me, at least, that was a huge breakthrough in the conversation and allowed some of us to start motivating some actual action out of that. One of, the, one of the hurdles to get across in a very slow emergency like sea level rise, although we're beginning in Vancouver and in San Francisco to see evidence of increasing uh, winter flooding in, in certain parts of the, the roads and the landscape that were not subject to flooding before, except in very exceptional events, um, was that people can be pretty complacent about it. it. Leave it to the scientists and the engineers and they'll think about it and whatever. And we said, well, we could do that. Um, because the solutions will be expensive. But the other way to think about that question is what is the cost of inaction? And this is getting a little bit to your point, uh, John, about the investments uh, actually can, um, if they're the right smart investments, can turn a cost into an opportunity in a way. So in, these are hard to read numbers here, the, the, the way the slide's coming across. But basically just inside the city of Vancouver, of uh, San Francisco, very conservative estimates um, 54 to 75 billion dollars. There have been some preliminary looks at this in the Vancouver Metro, not just city of Vancouver, which are somewhere in the 50 billion dollar range. And these are conservative uh, estimates. There's no, and these do not take into account the uh, interruption of business or any of those kinds of things because the notion is we could have time to plan for, for this and, and avoid a number of those costs, if not completely at least a lot of them. But just looking at the asset value in today's dollars of public and private uh, assets, those are, that's a pretty good reason to start acting. Um, the other thing that we uh, did is to say, how should we even think about approaching planning for sea level rise? And so with the work of the, the planning department and um, some consultants who helped us, 
we kind of came up with this sort of learning circle, if you will, which is a continuous cycle, um, but begins with um, uh, evidence, at least as far as we understand it, including an understanding of the science that you've just heard from the prior speakers, um, and uh, a notion that that science will evolve, our understanding will evolve. Um, and so the, I remember two key points that, that John mentioned in, in the San Francisco debate were, uh, one, we haven't fully mapped the melting uh, of the uh, Antar ice, I, Antarctic ice sheets, and none of the models have actually plugged the, the methane gas phenomenon <laughs> into this, and, and actually agriculture and, and um, cattle uh, raising and so forth are growing, and, and methane is, is, needs to be plugged in. And so, you know, basically, your, the projections are really conservative now, and to get um, global scientific consensus around projection it takes years. So the one thing that uh, is true is that those projections aren't getting better, they're getting worse each time. <laughs> Scientists get together and, and vet the evidence. So count on things getting worse, but you know, you're gonna learn as we go through the decades here or through the years. So the second piece in the puzzle here is really to assess with a pretty clear eye what is vulnerable. Um, and we'll have a little bit of information on that on Vancouver in just a moment. Um, Vulnerability is different than risk. Assessing risk may be a, a matter of saying, you know, if the, if the tube to the, the BART system in, in the San Francisco Bay Area floods, because one of the openings before it goes underground uh, or the Muni Metro uh, is exposed and is floodable, um, that's a big deal, because millions of people are trying to get to work using those devices. And which opened up a whole conversation about, we always thought the people at risk from sea level rise were the people in the inundation zone, people in the properties and businesses. Totally wrong. Everybody on the landscape is at risk because if the sewers back up, you don't get to flush your toilet. If you can't get to work because the roads are flooded or the transit system is um, uh, out of service because it's uh, gone through an a inundated area, everybody is affected. So an, a notion there of combining what's actually vulnerable and what's, uh, how would you rate your risks? Do we actually care if a certain park floods or not? Probably not as much as a bridge approach or a transit line. Um, next, developing with that information an adaptation plan, which itself has to be uh, adaptable uh, to this cycle of learning. Uh, to do some implementation, and we've got text there on the side that sort of explains in San Francisco what we were doing. Uh, monitoring, both how well those things work in, in a variety of uh, conditions, including storm events. Uh, and then um, finally going back to understanding what do we know n more and new about both our practices and the science. And so I think this is a fairly simple diagram, but a very powerful one in terms of we're not going to get it all figured out right now. And yet we need to, um, to as professionals, um, uh, get started and engage in this. And as a whole community, engage everyone in this uh, adaptive uh, learning cycle. Um, so we did do the second bubble there was about assessing uh, vulnerability. And um, uh, we did do this in uh, San Francisco um, and uh, found out that the biggest inhibitor to our knowledge here was really lack of data. We didn't really know how the systems, what systems were at risk and, and what their conditions were. And I'd be surprised if this weren't the case in every major city in North America, that you, you, you don't know what you don't know and uh, a lot of this is buried information. Nonetheless, we got a good start on this and, and that information will continue uh, to um, improve. So uh, the th one sort of missing image here is that um, Based on this, uh, when we got to the, um, the number four there, the uh, let's create an adaptation plan, was that simply a matter of raising things up above a certain uh, elevation? Uh, what does it mean to sort of rebuild the city over a period of decades to um, avoid uh, the impacts of sea level rise and, and climate change? And we thought, you know, um, just having the infrastructure engineers do that work is not good enough. Because when we looked at our shoreline, it has habitat value, it has recreational value, it has cultural identity, and it has a whole bunch of infrastructure. 
So what are we going to do about and and real property values as well? What are we going to do about that? So um, this is when I called Hank Ovink uh, and asked him to come to San Francisco, which he was glad to do, and said, um, Hank, we really liked what you did in New York around the rebuild by design post Hurricane Sandy as a process. And the reason that process was so attractive is uh, it opened up the imagination, an informed imagination, to potential solutions. And that was done at a metropolitan scale. We eventually have launched now something in San Francisco uh, at the metropolitan scale, but using an, an interesting methodology, which was A, to make it a design challenge rather than a straight competition where all the teams, and they got down to 10 interdisciplinary teams, were able to learn from each other because they were each given a different spot on the landscape and they were not actually trying to win, but they were trying to improve learning. Uh, secondly, they had to be interdisciplinary teams. They had to have economists, landscape architects, community engagement specialists, uh, and so forth and so on as a team, uh, not just the usual engineer and planner. Um, that they had to um, submit halfway through the design challenge uh, a written understanding of the challenge in front of them before they were allowed to s draw a single drawing. Like, it wasn't just calling the architects and have them sketch up some stuff, but really make sure you can demonstrate that you're worthy of the second round in the challenge to get the second half of your stipend. And, and, um, and Hank may have des uh, described this in his uh, talk here a few weeks ago, but it, it, the point there was that people had to really demonstrate they understood this challenge, not only scientifically, but also in terms of communities they were gonna be operating and with agencies that they would have to rely on to implement those designs. So we found that really fascinating and said, so let's try to take that DNA out of that process and replicate it in the San Francisco Bay Area. So that has resulted with the good fortune of getting uh, um, money from the Rockefeller Foundation, about $2 million, and we raised some additional uh, dollars. I put in the first half million from the paltry planning budget, <laughs> and, uh, and we got this design challenge off the ground. It's, un it's going on right now. If you want to go on the internet and look up um, Resilient by Design, um, we, we uh, stole the uh, acronym from Hank's group. Um, but rebranded it as Resilient by Design. So look on it, and those teams are just now in their first stage of getting to know the sites and the communities, and they'll be producing designs, much as you saw um, in the post-Hurricane Sandy uh, New York event. But I think they're, they were really thinking about a storm, and here we're really focusing on long-term sea level rise. So keep your, keep your eye on that one. So for Vancouver, um, you know, here's, <laughs> You guys know where this is, the kids pool here. Um, this was a few years ago, 2012, I think, um, winter flooding. So it's already happening in Vancouver. There's just no question about it. And it's gonna mean some strategic thinking and frankly, some trial and error. Um, this is a map showing the likely um, uh, flood inundation for a one meter sea level rise. Um, and as uh, John's alluded to, that may be much sooner than the end of century. So this at least gives us a focus of where to make some of those key interventions. Um, so it's not the whole city that needs to be intervened. We can do that strategically, but it does mean involving those communities and what the future of the shoreline uh, wants to look like and what other co-benefits could come out of thinking about creative uh, design solutions there. So perhaps in Vancouver, we will also mount a design challenge on that scale, and we've had some early uh, talks about uh, that, uh, including with Hank. Um, uh, this is called Next Steps, and we're speaking here of Next Steps very broadly, that there are different time frames that we need to think in and act in. So the immediate is really um, right now getting uh, our arms around the, the planning process and how are we going to think about it locally in Vancouver, who are we going to engage, what is our understanding of the science, what is our vulnerability and risk assessment sort of tell us? Uh, and then followed by a period of short-term uh, action. As John has advised, let's get started. Um, and we know that the consequences will be more, more uh, substantial in the medium and, and long terms, but not too early to start thinking about those. If we're gonna rebuild a bridge or some major portion, even the seawall, a major portion of infrastructure, why don't we think about what it m might need to be in 2100? or at least how it might be adapted 30 or 40 years from now to serve in 2100. 
So here's, uh, uh, don't need to spend much time on this, but this is that immediate term um, planning time frame, and I would say this year's focus is really on um, engaging the public and being able to educate. So, so far in, in 2017, we engaged about 4,000 people across Vancouver in a whole range of activities. Um, uh, farmers markets, uh, street fairs, um, neighborhood meetings, and so forth, um, to sort of get across um, some ideas. And um, also to engage a new kind of thinking that's really a very old kind of thinking. So here's Chief uh, Ian Campbell, who I think may have been part of an earlier series here. He, um, uh, actually when I met with the chiefs of the first three nations over a, a, a different issue recently, uh, looking at developing some of their uh, lands in the city of Vancouver. Um, he said, you know, we, we have time. We are, we're patient investors. We, we, we can, uh, we're not the, the, the developer who's going to come in and just do something to make a quick buck. We're here for a while. He said, that's great. You know, we don't often get that. So what's your kind of investment horizon? What do you think about? Thinking that, you know, it's a far stretch for a developer to think beyond 15 years, maybe 30 years. He said, well, you know, probably a thousand years to start with. Okay, now we're talking, right? Now, now we've got a very different lens to put on things and a very different way of thinking about the natural and built environment and our stewardship of that place, this place. Um, so again, as I mentioned, we've done a lot of uh, outreach activities. We'll continue to do those as we get into what might be possible solutions. Right now, a lot of it is around educating about the phenomenon and. Um, and raising ed education about that, including really getting to kids. Here's a, a pamphlet that um, is uh, directed at both adults uh, and children. And you're seeing the first couple images of this. This is actually one meter long. <laughs> and actually, uh, on the back side, there's a meter of sea level rise. And so the question is, what would it take to avoid a second one of these? And what do we do about the first one of these? And so this takes kids through uh, a, a quick learning of what is sea level rise, where is it coming, how is it related to climate change, and what might you and the city do about it? So that's the kind of thing where I think we really need to get into the consciousness of um, people uh, in Vancouver, knowing that uh, change is not easy. So who wants to change? Everybody wants to change. Who wants to change? Mm, not me, I don't want to change my behavior, I don't want to spend more on this, or whatever it happens to be. So big, big challenge there. And that's where I think a paradigm shift in thinking, borrowing a chapter from the First Nations uh, and from other schools of thought might be really helpful uh, here in, in thinking about uh, change. So it gets down to some new approaches and we've, we've talked about those. Here's uh, Hank Ovink that we've mentioned before coming with a deep uh, Dutch experience borrowed by the Obama White House to land some of that thinking on, uh, on these shores. Um, he was here recently. We've engaged him in conversation about bringing some of that thought process into it. Um, very Dutch, very Northern European approach, but obviously a very practical one in, in, in some ways. But Hank's other side is not just to find the practical engineered approach, um, because that often fails, as was the case with the Rotterdam gates, because you can't think of everything. But most importantly, to engage people in making solutions that work for them. And I think um, he deserves a lot of credit for that. So we know we can borrow from experiences uh, elsewhere. Here are some on the top, and we can employ these in certain um, uh, parts of Vancouver. These are kind of the easy ones, right? Raise a house, uh, raise the earth under the house, um, the more inventive ones have to do with more uh, urban locations and, frankly, with more multi-purpose solutions, like the one on the right on the New Jersey shore, I believe it is, um, where um, we, we create wetlands, natural defenses against storms, where we improve ecological values, have great recreational space, uh, as well as um, mitigating the effects of, of sea level rise. I think that's it. So here we are, our little, uh, our little island on the earth, and, uh, and a wonderful shoreline to think about how, what is the future of that shoreline? And it's gonna be different than what it is today. Will it be the Manhattan version you saw a few moments ago? Will it be something else? Will it be some combination of those images? That's what we need to engage everybody in, and I don't have the answers tonight, but we'll, we'll find them. Thank you.
thank you very much, Gail, for uh, giving us a lot of food for thought. Um, and, and I think uh, where you left off, basically, by saying that uh, you know we, we can uh, come together, we can learn from each other across from different cities across the world, um, and uh, by engaging the general public as stakeholders in, in the conversations, we can actually start to arrive at solutions that sort of work for everyone. Uh, you know, we, we started by John saying that you can almost crawl away or walk away from sea level rise, but I, I think there's now some light at the end of the tunnel saying how we, how we actually do that. So thank you very much for that perspective. So we're gonna go in a couple of minutes to uh, opening up the floor for questions, so please uh, get ready for that. Before we do that, I, I do wanna touch on one area which uh, we didn't quite get there yet, but uh, I, I would like to get some perspectives from our three panelists. And that's about financing and money and, and resourcing some of these very interesting solutions. Now, John talked about the Paris uh, Climate Agreement in uh, late 2015. And he talked about that, how that was about limiting the flow, uh, the, the temperature change to two degrees Celsius. But there was another very interesting element of that agreement, which was that the countries agreed that they would uh, pull together $100 billion a year to start to address some of those challenges that are coming from climate change. Uh, but the ground has shifted slightly. Uh, we know that uh, President Trump, Trump has declared that he would actually pull out from that, and I think that constitutes about 15 or 20 billion of that 100 billion. So that, that we already know that there might be a bit of a dent in that. So the question, or questions I should say, is uh, when we have, let's say for the sake of argument, that $100 billion available, where should we spend it? Should we spend it mostly on mitigation or mostly on adaptation? And this was a question I gave to my graduate students last year, and they came out with some interesting answers, but I, you, know, you being the experts, I would like to hear from you. Sort of a same, uh, on the same vein, uh, when cities are faced with these challenges, where do they find the money? Uh, again, uh, one of the studies uh, that SFU had done last year, we were getting some kind of crude back of the envelope type estimates that for example, for protecting the city of Richmond uh, against sea level rise, we might need to invest eight or nine billion dollars in, in various types of uh, structural solutions. And, and the question is, where does that money come from? So I, I leave it to you. Maybe, John, we'll, we'll start with you and uh, see uh, how you handle the, the money part of the equation. Well, thank Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. There. OK. Um, certainly, that's a, a valid question, and, and it's often asked. First of all, we have to put it in time perspective. It's not like we have to find the money in the next budget cycle. Uh, this, is, this is a decadal, over decades time frame, first of all. And um, we're, and 30 years is a good time horizon. It's a building cycle, a mortgage cycle in many cases. We think of it, um, that's, that's far enough to see big problems and to get us beyond the what do we do in the next couple of years. What I've told a number of mayors who said, but where's the money gonna come from, whether it be Miami or San Francisco, I said, I don't know where the money's gonna come from, but you will find the money or your voters won't be there, if you think about it. I mean, the water doesn't care whether you had the budget or not. And this isn't optional, like do we fund the arts and preschool or adapting to sea level rise? We really need to open up our minds a little bit and realize that this is a disruptive concept. And even the resilience by design contest that, that Hank did, a lot of that money it turned out wasn't quite as creative as we'd, we'd hoped because it wound up funding a wastewater treatment plant or a new drainage system that was already on the books, it wasn't quite as far-sighted in some cases as, as they had hoped. We, what comes back to this is disruptive. And we will find the money because if you're flooded, your parts of your city disappear. But it's thinking of it over more years, I think. Okay, Gil? Yeah, I guess I, what I'd add to that, it's true, but it's not always a matter of finding new money. Um, city of uh, Vancouver spends hundreds of millions every year on infrastructure. 
the province altogether probably spends well over a billion dollars if you put together all the municipalities in, in the province. So, and cities have to maintain and, and ultimately replace assets on a cycle. So some of, some of the work needed is more urgent because there's flooding in certain areas right now. But much of it is just being a lot smarter about future investments. And so in San Francisco, for example, um, we had a, a, a rigid discipline uh, starting with this sea level rise work, even though we didn't know all the answers of saying, what are you doing when you're coming forward with a budget request for a new capital improvement um, for sea level rise? And, and here, here are the numbers. Uh, what are you doing about it? You had to justify your expenditure before you were even allowed to get the money to, to spend on that. Um, in uh, Vancouver, uh, the city council um, uh, raised the um, floodplain elevation for new building. So talk about leveraging all the private dollars by a meter, uh, a little over a meter. So we're now at 4.8, 4.6 uh, meters uh, above sea level two. To, for all new buildings, right? You, just, you don't get to build uh, in the floodplain anymore. Uh, if you are in a, fl a flood uh, risk area, you've got to elevate your, your building site and put your mechanicals above and so forth. So there are ways to just be smart about the spending you do all the time. Right, right. Good example. Yeah. Excellent. Sybil, do you want to add to that? Yeah, um, I guess I'll go. Whoops. Thank you. I'll go back to uh, part of the way that you framed it, um, a deal to begin with, which is sort of looking at it from a global perspective. Um, and as you said, that the amount of uh, funds that um, are going to be needed globally to address um, climate change overall. And the challenge is, um, and the sad part of it is, is that the, um, the, the, the amount of money that was going to be needed and that was um, put as the benchmark, that has not come anywhere close to that and it's really lagging behind. But um, you asked whether if you had um, $100 billion, would you put it 50-50 with mitigation and adaptation or what would you do? Because the point is, is that we absolutely, as you've heard tonight, need to do both. And it's not just, of course, about sea level rise. It's about all the other impacts and the change in, the, in our climate systems that will be impacting um, uh, people's health, that will be impacting a whole range of issues um, that we'll have to deal with our, our food systems, um, our um, insurance systems, uh, many other things. So I think we have to look for opportunities where we can marry the adaptation and the mitigation um, and not look at them as two separate things always. We have to do both. Um, and I think also when we come back to the issue of um, equitability in some way, as who pays for it. Um, I think we really have to look at, uh, we have to look at that, and we have to look at that around the world because it's, as we know, um, it's the emissions of greenhouse gases from the industrialized countries, mainly in the north, that is, has caused the climate change up to this point, and that we have a responsibility, we have to take that responsibility for the impacts that are going to be felt around the world. Um, so it's, 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 it's challenging. It's not only taking care of our home base here in British Columbia or wherever one lives, but it's also taking the responsibility for um, the impacts around the world. And so part of that is sharing knowledge too. You know? The knowledge that can be created here in, in British Columbia, how can we share that knowledge with other um, countries around the world, other um, cities around the world, and also benefit from their knowledge? And just one comment. We did the mitigation thing that I, I kind of mentioned up front. Mitigation here could be slowing the warming with, with the greenhouse part or mitigating the flood impact from the flooding. Those are two entirely different things. And sometimes when we use a jargony word like mitigation, it, it, it may not clarify anything, in fact. And so I, again, respectfully suggest that all of us involved with climate uh, not use that word because it's not common and talk about slowing the warming or reducing the flooding. Not very hard words to use. And, and to reduce the warming is really what we need to do, of course, is we have to decrease our greenhouse gas right. emissions. In right. fact, we have to get our greenhouse gas emissions down to zero, net zero, by about 2070 in order to keep the global warming below a two degrees global average. Um, let that sink in. We need to get our greenhouse gas emissions down 
to essentially net zero. So any emissions of any use of fossil fuels that's putting CO2 into the atmosphere, any emissions of methane, um, all of that needs to either be zero or we need to have ways of taking the CO2 out of the atmosphere or the methane out of the atmosphere and storing it somewhere else. Yeah, Gil. I'll just add one final point. You'll never get past question one here, it looks like. <laughs> but I, I think another piece of this um, and something we built into the resilient uh, by design challenge in the Bay Area was to think about multi-hazards at the same time. So, for example, uh, many of the flood prone areas are also the highest seismic risk zones because much of it is on landfill and so forth. And to think about um, the storm events uh, in coupling with sea level rise, you need to think about the, um, the uh, uh, storm effect of the drainage from the rest of the landscape coming into those same areas. It's not merely predicting the rise of the sea and the crashing of the wave, but the enormous new volume of water with in more intense storms coming down the landscape. And so um, one, one stark example of that was a debate in San Francisco. The port uh, found out that their um, seawall that maintains that historic uh, San Francisco waterfront was um, very vulnerable seismically. It's a 103-year-old, now 105-year-old seawall in many parts, and it was getting a little shaky when they did the investigations. So they were in a rush to go out to the voters and get a $5 billion bond to rebuild two miles of, of seawall with historic piers and all that stuff. Well, would the voters actually be willing to do that if it was going to flood over over top with uh, with sea level rise in a few short years? So, thinking beyond that and thinking about multiple uh, solutions here within the same move, I think is another way of thinking differently about some of these investments. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. And I think several of you uh, touched on a point that I would like to come back to if there's if there's enough time, which is the sort of the global scale and particularly the human side of things and uh, addressing countries which do not have the kind of privileges and resources as we do here. But I'll, I'll leave that aside for now and open up the floor for any questions. Uh, just some points of order to keep in mind. Uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, if, you're, if your question is pointed to a, uh, a panelist, uh, please uh, identify that. And if you can keep your questions or comments short, we'll have a chance of taking as many of those on board as we go. So the floor is now open. Who would like to break the ice? Okay, so we have two, okay, well, let's start with you. I'll take maybe two or three questions at a go and then bring them back to the panel. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Danny, thank you for the panelists. Um, this is more for John. What happens in a, um, if there's an abrupt climate change and we enter a new state where all this research and planning sort of goes to waste because sea level rise might go much quicker? Okay, let's take one more question down here. Hi there, my name is Baldwin. Um, I'm just wondering what responsibility does the private sector have in all of this because we know that uh, for the people that build a lot of our city, you know, they are private developers. They they make their money up front, and then it seems like they offload the risk to this to to us as as citizens. And I'm wondering, you know, how do we sort of prevent the government from bas basically having to backstop all of their activities while they maintain their profits? Should they be responsible for paying for a good chunk of what they're doing right now? Thanks. Okay, so let's start with you, John. One of the questions was what, pointed to you. Sure. The Abrupt climate change, it, it, we, we get into a time scale problem because to us, a year seems like a long time sometimes. Climate doesn't change quite that quickly. And um, to melt the ice, as we're even trying now, um, to, to melt the ice it seems, but that takes a, long, a longer time. And when it gets, so from climate changing the, the global temperature because of the greenhouse gases to melting the ice to sea level rise, there is a lag time there, okay? It, now, at some point in Antarctica and Greenland, we're going to see some things like an avalanche in effect, a giant avalanche, I mean, a thousand times bigger than we can imagine, or like a similar earthquake, of the ice changing. And that can happen 
fairly abruptly. There's no way of predicting that, as I was trying to suggest. So um, it's, it's a combination between the, the, uh, the changing climate, which is happening because of the greenhouse gases, as Sybil said, the warming planet, and the inability to say, how does that kilometer and a half of ice, when does it go through some collapse points? And so we could get that next week, a collapse point. But probably not at the really serious level we could see a meet, you know, 50 centimeters of sea level rise, not for a few decades. Anyone else? Maybe tackle, the, tackle the second question, um, if that's okay. Yes, please. Okay. Um, yeah, the private sector does have a responsibility, um, and not simply as those uh, generating tax dollars that generally go uh, into government to help with this, but but for the development side, which you mentioned. Um, let me give you a couple of examples where the conversation is very live right now and where we haven't exactly settled on the, the shares. But in the, along the Fraser River, um, for example, in the east of Fraser Land uh, area, where we are actually actively designing um, a, a berm, a dike, uh, some system, and we're looking at options right now about what that should be as new development occurs there on the, on the Fraser in Vancouver. Um, uh, knowing that assessing a portion of that cost, a big portion of that cost to the development that's at most uh, risk potentially and would be the biggest beneficiary of that is, is part of the conversation right now uh, in negotiations with, uh, with that developer. Um, when it comes to things like, well, what about the um, storm sewer system that is where there are maybe a partial beneficiary but much of the upland uh, residential neighborhoods are the ones most at effect. Do we assess some other kind of charge on, on uh, those properties as well? So not every single feature um, is an, an equal share, and so we're going through that conversation. The other one I'd point to is the Northeast False Creek uh, area um, and uh, near BC Place and uh, Rogers Arena and uh, bordering False Creek. Um, and that's a case where we're just outright requiring uh, new development not only to, to raise new buildings above the floodplain, but to pay a substantial cost, um, maybe the majority of the cost, of building new road infrastructure that's raised and making sure that the uh, combination of the seawall redesign and rebuild and the park space that they'd be contributing to uh, has an elevation that is sufficient for, um, you know, depend, who knows, between 2050 and 2100 uh, protecting against sea level rise. So in those cases where we are seeing substantial development, we're actually requiring uh, developers to pay a good share of the solution. Okay. And I think some of the question was also directed towards various industrial sectors. And, and Sybil, I'll, I'll maybe put you on the spot a little bit, but you know, are things like carbon taxes a way to go uh, to start to to um, somehow equalize the the, the uh, cost of impact versus uh, you know finding solutions, um, and I know PICS has done a fair bit of work on on uh, carbon tax uh, issues. So the question is, should we be um, charging, um, let's say? industries that are using a lot of fossil fuel and thereby emitting a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, should we be charging them an amount per CO2 molecule or ton of CO2 that they emit? And of course, you know, the, the province does have a, a tax on carbon um, and that that tax is going to increase um, with time. And that also at the federal level, that's been um, also uh, put forward and um, provinces, all the provinces are having to come forward with their plans on that. Um, I think that the carbon tax issue is a very interesting one. Um, it can provide, if it's, um, it can provide revenue for investments in um, climate um, planning um, and, and also changing the way that we have our energy system and getting away from the use of fossil fuels. Those can result in, in you know, finance, finances that can be used. Um, but um, we also have to realize that 
um, it's it's there. It's complex in a way, um, and that I think I think personally that it has to be a combination of a carbon tax and regulation. And I don't know if you know that uh, Manitoba just came forward within the last week or so with their plan um, as to how they're going to deal with the um, essentially mandated. Uh, carbon taxing that the federal government is, has has um, put on the table, and they're coming forward with a plan to combine carbon tax and regulation, um, and um, saying that they can achieve the amount of reduction in uh, greenhouse gases from their province from this combination, and relying less on the uh, carbon tax than um, the federal government had, had put forward. So I think that there are numerous ways to achieve. Um, the same result, um, but the important part is um, trying to do it also in an equitable way. There's concern, of course, by businesses that um, ha do use a lot of fossil fuel, that that could put them at a disadvantage um, relative to, let's say, our neighbors to the south where there's not a carbon tax, um, to the south meaning across that border. Um, <laughs> we don't have a we don't have a wall there yet, but I've heard that there are plans. Uh, <laughs> um, that Canada would build it, though. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, right. So I think there there are numerous issues that have to be dealt with um, and and, um, and and evaluated. When a carbon tax is one way to try and get. Um, industry, but also individuals to reduce their um, emissions of greenhouse gases. I think one, if I could just make one other point sure, about please, that, please. which is some of you in the audience may be saying, well, gee, you know, in BC, you know, our electricity comes from hydropower, and that's a clean source of electricity. Um, in fact, over 90% of our electricity here comes from hydropower. That's true. But the other side of that is that Electricity only accounts for somewhere around a third of our total energy use in the province. That about two thirds of our energy use is coming from fossil fuel for transportation, for our cars and, and our, our, the trucks, um, uh, for transport, transportation, and also for heating and cooling, a lot of natural gas being used. So I think it's important to keep that in mind um, when we're talking about what we need to do here in BC. Yes, we do have clean electricity, but we also are using a lot of fossil fuel. And as we electrify our transportation systems, as we electrify our heating and cooling, our re need for more electricity um, is going to be there. So we need to come up with ways of increasing our electricity production um, to compensate for the um, decrease in our fossil fuel use. If, if I can add um, something that we've gone from sea level, which is the focus of the evening, into, and we've, we've proven it, we've, we've, got, we've migrated from sea level into the energy and the other climate impacts, which is inevitable, but it becomes a distraction too because even if we went to zero emissions, not in 2070 tomorrow, we're still gonna have sea level rise. So one of the things I, that I like to leave audience with is say we have to do two things simultaneously. Slow the warming with the greenhouse gas reduction as we're discussing now and adapt to higher sea level anyway. It's not one or the other. And while we do have to discuss both, it's easier to do the fossil fuel reduction and the greenhouse gas than to lift cities meters, okay? It, it, we can it, have a it, little discussion Fine, about that's fine. That. But, but, <laughs> but my point is that you have to do both. And, and we can drive electric cars, we can use hydropower, we can do lots of things, carbon taxes, all of those things to deal with the energy part. But as we've also discussed, the heavy lifting, as it were, is how do we prepare for meters of sea level rise in the coming century. And I should say that besides sea level rise, there's four other forms of flooding. I like to talk about the five forms of flooding. There's storms that we think of. There's heavy rainfall, which is getting worse. Runoff, where it goes downhill somewhere. King tides, and then sea level rise. The difference is that the first four are temporary, and they recede, and you can be resilient. Sea level won't go down for a 1,000 years. So it has a different character than the other four forms of flooding, but makes them worse, too. So it's all how we frame things. We need to do both. Mm -hmm. But while we're trying to figure out the sea level solutions, we shouldn't be diverted into just the climate change adaptations and the greenhouse gas. We need to do both. 
and remember that we have to, we have to deal with that thing of, of the flooding issue. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, yes, ma'am. Mike. Yeah, um, push the button. Okay, I'll start over again. Uh, I'm glad you brought it back to sea level rise because I'm a coastal engineer and not just sea level rise, all the other factors that contribute to marine water levels and we design for storm events. Um, I have a couple of comments just having uh, worked in British Columbia and internationally for a couple of decades about some of the stumbling blocks to working in British Columbia in particular. Um, there's kind of three communities, three or four communities that I deal with. There's the technical community, which is an international community. It's not that other countries have expertise that we don't have here. We're an international community. We share expertise in internationally. We're very aware we've been talking about climate change and how to deal with it for decades. There is the public, they've become more aware. In British, and then on the client side, we have the private sector, which varies depending, and the public sector clients. One of the stumbling blocks in British Columbia for moving forward in dealing with coastal issues related to climate change has been the regulators, planners, and policymakers who, just as an example, it took 10 years of lobbying to get the provincial government to do a study on how to incorporate climate change into uh, dike design and coastal management. It's been six years since those reports were done for a very low budget, and the province has just in the last month or so finally adopted the recommendations in a watered-down uh, format from, what, from the original recommendations. So 16 years. Um, the funding, uh, it's interesting to have panel speakers who have worked in other jurisdictions because as a consultant here in Vancouver, we joke that a project, a public sector project, you'll get a budget of $50,000 in Vancouver, you go across the border to Seattle, the same project, the budget's $500,000, you go to San Francisco, it's $5 million. These are our stumbling blocks, not lack of expertise, not lack of knowing how to approach the problem. It's the structural uh, slowness in adopting recommendations and the lack of funding, in my experience. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll take maybe another question or two, if there are any, yes? Um, building on what you were saying, Susan, and I wouldn't mind talking with you afterwards. My name is Lisa Moffat. I'm an urban planner here in, in Vancouver. And what I'm hearing, and I was actually um, in attendance when the Duck Economic Mission was in town, so got to speak with a lot of those folks. And their aha moment was hearing from all these different municipalities around the region talking about individually what they're doing to address sea level rise. And, my, and the, the Dutch were like, well, well, who's having this conversation together? Like, nobody's having this conversation. So that's my question is, why aren't we looking at sea level rise at the watershed level and approaching, you know, there's the really good study out of architects out of Chicago did it for the Great Lakes region. And they're talking to 100 municipalities in the Great Lakes water basin. Why isn't that happening here? Thank you very much. Very interesting question. Uh, we'll take one more. Hello, thank you very much for all the presentation. It's been excellent. Uh, my name is Eric Carreras. I'm just a citizen here. Uh, the question was, um, you guys talk about, uh, or Mr. Kelly, you're mentioning um, in essentially enforcing certain requirements for developers, such as increasing their uh, the development up one meter and, and such. Would that then, uh, I, I don't know about this, would it pose increase um, living costs and housing costs for the residents? and then essentially just offloading that cost to the people of Vancouver who are already having housing issues? I'm not sure. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we're, the, the question is, there's a slow response, um, and uh, is the response at the right scale? You know, whether we need to go even larger. 
and who, at the end of the day, bears the costs, and, and how do you distribute those costs? So I throw it back to you, to the panel. They're looking at me, so I guess I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a shot. I mean, there are a bunch of questions in there. First of all, um, to the first two speakers, um, in, in my career anyway, I think it's um, not advisable to wait for senior levels of government to take action. Um, and so I think cities are the leaders. Uh, and even in, in um, motivating regional cooperation and regional scale solution, it often starts with a leading city. And that was my experience in the San Francisco uh, design challenge, which there was a receptive regional body, the Bay Area, or the Bay Conservation and Development Commission, who um, was kind of going through a rethinking. Their mission had been to sort of protect the shoreline from uh, incursion by development but hadn't really taken on sea level rise until really that same period of time that we were motivating this this design think. And so I think um, uh, I reached out across the bay to Oakland and down south to San Jose, and we had a coalition of cities that actually pushed. In response to the other question, I think that, again, unless the province is, is restricting us from something, we're not counting on, on their money <laughs> or relying on their standards. Like we, we at the city of Vancouver went beyond the standard in terms of what the new floodplain level was. And we'll continue to do that by pushing the design envelope. When it comes to raising the money, yes, of course, it would be great to have both provincial and federal resources, but we're gonna have to figure out smarter ways uh, to get started um, until they come on board. Um, so I would, I would maybe maybe leave it there. And I guess to the housing cost piece, um, it, you know, everything does add up in, in the housing cost arena, and, and this is an incremental cost there. What we're finding on the for sale housing piece is that um, the market is setting prices way above the cost of housing. Um, and on the, on the rental side, it's more, it gets more reflected, uh, I think, in the rent. So there's a, there's a impact there. Um, but uh, rental buildings have a long payback period. They tend to be patient holders. And so that, that effect could be ameliorated versus a for sale, you want that whole captured right away. Um, so I don't know if that hel helps you there, but I think that there's a way that I don't, I think doing the smart thing with sea level rise mitigation and individual development, even if it's also helping pay for a, a longer um, uh, shore-wide solution, helping to pay for that, which we expect development to do. Um, I think it's a kind of a smart down payment on the future of, of residential costs. It's kind of the way we look at it. Yeah, and just adding on to that, actually, I, I think there's another way to look at it, which is that by requiring that buildings be a meter higher, that they're going to have a longer lifespan, a better payback period, actually cheaper cost. If you were, and it's whether it be rental properties or condominiums for sale, and I think there was a project in North Vancouver, as I recall, about five or six years ago, where they decided to actually elevate it by bringing in fill or pilings. I can't remember how they were going to do it. But they realized it was, it was an asset. It, it made their building more valuable because they could talk about the lower flooding potential. So at all levels, once you have that longer term vision, it can become cheaper. So it's not that telling properties they must elevate when they do renovations or build a new structure. It may actually be quite the opposite. Instead of having flooding costs and who's going to pay for that and the building has to be torn down and demolished, maybe the building will last for 100 years. And a slightly different way of looking at it is that if it does cost more to live in a building that is in a future flood prone prone area, maybe it will encourage us to not live in those areas. Really, we should be thinking about the real resilience here, maybe. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So I had three more hands. There was uh, a hand back there. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Karen Kilbride. I live upstream from Vancouver, and I'm very concerned about the removal of vegetation, uh, trees, all along the Fraser River. And I'm wondering if you could comment on, um, use the term mitigation, by using vegetation or increased vegetation to reduce flooding. Okay. Uh, sir, you also had your hand up. 
Uh, hi. Hello. My name is Jason. Uh, my question was for John Englander, and that was about two things. One is that, are you, just to be clear, um, if we go to zero emissions tomorrow, do we have an idea like how long sea level is going to rise? Is it going to be over hundreds of years? Are we going to go up meters regardless? And, and then about inflection points, when do we expect to see something like that? I think it was partly answered in his presentation, but I'll let him respond. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, my name is Doug. I live upstream also from Vancouver, but I'm very concerned about this issue. Uh, I'm, my question is to do with um, sea, level, sea level rise and its implications in terms of potential impacts on seismic activity. Uh, for one, just in terms of uh, increased weights on, you know, uh, areas that uh, are seismically active, as well um, what, you know, ice melts mean for uh, ocean systems, uh, fishery systems, um, you know, current systems. You know, I've always uh, wondered what the current thinking is with regards to the um, North Atlantic current dynamics with uh, increased freshwater moving into um, those zones. Okay, thanks. So we have an sure, interesting set of questions. I, I, I can deal with that. Um, the fresh water from Greenland particularly is a good example, somewhat to Alaska too, but certainly Greenland is the better example, is um, making the water less salty uh, because it's, it's the, the melting of the ice, and that is having an effect already to slow the Atlantic, what's called the meridional overturning current. We may think of the Gulf Stream as a component of that, but it's the conveyor belt of the Atlantic, and there are some signs, and that will have big changes to everything from weather patterns to fisheries, so yes, you're right on that. Um, and let me think. That Jason's question that, um, you know, if, if we went to zero emissions theoretically, which obviously you can't do tomorrow, but we'd still have a declining curve of sea level rise for many decades, if not centuries. Um, and um, as far as where's the inflection point, I think we're at one. I mean, the, the rate of sea level increasing went from 1.7 millimeters, you know, really, really tiny, but it's already 3.9 millimeters in just the last couple of decades. And I think we really are at the start of the inflection point. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, I saw a few more hands. Yes. Hello. Good evening. My name is Nikita. Um, I just wanted to understand the gravity of the situation of sea level rise. So, approximately speaking, how much cost per head would a Vancouverite ha end up paying for in the case of a major flooding event, given that we haven't um, taken any adaptive measures whatsoever? Okay. And there was another hand back here. Maybe not. Any other questions? Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Um, this one's more for Gil. Uh, for the city of Vancouver, what do you see as its greatest opportunity to adapt to sea level rise? Okay, so it looks like both questions are coming to you, Gil. <laughs> <laughs> um, great question. And um, I guess I think the opportunity, and I'm glad you framed it in that way, is... Um, really to rethink our shoreline, um, which is so critical to Vancouver's identity, whether you're in the downtown peninsula or on the Fraser or on the peninsula at UBC, wherever you happen to be on the Locarno, um, it will change and what will be our response to the change and how do we employ our imagination so that it works not only for all the scientific pieces that we've just heard, but also for the human purposes of um, uh, living in one of the most beautiful cities in the world, how do we continue that? And I think um, that's that's a real potential for for not only a resulting in a beneficial outcome if we're smart enough um, and adaptable enough, but also uh, as a way of engaging people. There's a lot of literature now that shows that scaring people works in the short term, but it doesn't hold their attention or their motivate their effort for very long. Um, motivating people around a better future is a much more powerful thing in the end. And so I think a lot of behavioral science is showing that now around climate change um, response. And um, so I, I think engaging people's imagination about what could be 
even with the dire situation we're facing, is, I think, the path forward. Um, okay. And the other question now, I, I don't recall. <laughs> I have to go back and ask again. Uh, uh, oh, the cost per head, yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't know, great one. I mean, we could translate those cost of inaction numbers um, for the Metro Vancouver, uh, downsize that to the city of Vancouver, translate if we did nothing, what would be the cost um, uh, of that inaction? What we haven't done since we don't really yet have the plan is what will that plan cost? Who will pay for it? Uh, how much will um, be a residual for taxpayers or rate payers in Vancouver. None of that analysis has been done. It's a great question. We're just not far along, enough along in our thinking about what is that adaptation plan and for how many decades would it be implemented? Because it's not as if the cost all lands at one time, right? Um, so great question. Um, I hope I can answer that question for you better in a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I think we'll have to um close the, the question and uh, part of it, and I would like to now switch in the last couple of minutes to uh, what I call the lightning round, where each of the panelists get basically 60 seconds or less to summarize their thoughts, okay? And I'm gonna be watching my clock carefully to see that you don't go over. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll start with you, John, and then we'll go to Sybil, and, and then uh, finally to, to Gail. So the clock starts okay. now. Um, so again, sea level is going to exacerbate the other kinds of flooding, the short-term flooding, and we need to start thinking about that and have the right terminology for it. So all flooding is not the same. Sea level is the slow drip, drip, drip that fills the bucket that makes the other short-term floodings worse. And, and just like mitigation, we need to we need to have the right words so that we understand things um, properly. First, uh, uh, second point: Vancouver deserves a lot of credit. The kind of discussion that's going on here that these people are doing, you probably are at the lead of of most cities in the world. Um, we need to think bigger. We've never done this. It's, it's going to be hard. It's an experiment. And we should take it easier. It's either the scariest thing in the world, which it is, or it's the greatest opportunity to re-engineer our world, which will have impacts on our greenhouse gas emissions once we realize the implications, but um, our governance, perhaps, and so on. So it's, uh, it's, it's scary and hairy, but it's, um, it could be the greatest opportunity to rethink our relationship to the Earth. Great, 57 seconds, perfect. Sybil. So I'll follow that with a saying that um, I think we need, whoop, oh, I think we need to remember that we're not alone. That everyone in the world is going to have to deal with climate change and all communities around the world that live on the oceans or near the oceans um, are going to have to deal with sea level rise. And that it's, it's to everyone's benefit to share knowledge, to share experiences. It's like gonna be a long-term learning process. Um, and as we've just heard, we can do it. Um, humans are incredibly innovative. Um, and so I think that we need to, we're very much at the beginning of this journey. Um, we're going to be facing climate change issues um, for centuries. Um, so. Um, we're not alone, and we need to um, learn from each other. Yeah, 52 seconds, perfect. Wow, okay, Go. pressure's on. Um, I, I would say that uh, we, we, um, we have to and we can think boldly and act boldly. Um, I, I believe in the human race to that extent. Uh, this is an unprecedented challenge. Um, and I think to do that, um, First of all, cities and increasingly metropolitan regions are going to be the leaders. And to pull that off, we need to invoke um, scientific and technical knowledge, but also the imagination. And thirdly, we need to invoke uh, participation and engagement of the community wholesale to, to really pull that off. So I would probably leave it there. How'd I do? Excellent, thank you, 40 seconds. Oh, okay. Right, uh, so before we close off, I would like to share some thoughts of mine as well, uh, but I would like to leave you with two uh, sort of little commercial as well. Uh, all the recordings of the uh, Octopus's Garden series are available uh, from the Pacific Water Research Center's website, and I think I'm uh, not uh, remiss in saying that the PEAKS website also has those, those links. So if you missed some of the earlier uh, discussions, you can 
go and uh, go have a recap of those. Uh, secondly, the Pacific Water Research Center is working on a new collaboration uh, with uh, the science world to start a new seminar series in spring of next year, and that one will focus on uh, water, energy, and food, and how you connect those three together uh, in terms of planning for some of these challenges that we were discussing today. So please keep uh, uh, keep uh, your your eyes on the on our website, and hopefully you'll you'll be able to enjoy that series as well. So from from my side, I've uh, spent uh, nearly two decades working for the UN. And my perspective is very much global. And I think what I've heard here today, of course, we know that things are getting worse. There may be what we call step changes, so sudden change into a new regime. Uh, but uh, the, the good side of the story is that step-by-step -step solutions are feasible. And by engaging through teamwork, by engaging communities, we can actually find really innovative solutions. And there's quite a few examples that we can pick from and, and modify them to apply in our, our own uh, situation and condition. So with that, we would like to bring tonight's proceedings to a close and the series to a close. In fact, uh, thank you very much for, to all of you for being a part of uh, this, uh, this series. And please join me in thanking our three panelists for tonight uh, in sharing some really brilliant insights with us.